Hey guys, we finally reached it to the end of chapter three, the world's longest chapter ever, to talk about protein synthesis here. So here's the overview of the process. Protein synthesis has two major steps called transcription and translation. Transcription occurs first, it occurs inside of the nucleus, and translation occurs second out in the cytoplasm at a ribosome. So we're gonna go through this process of how we make proteins, because that's literally what protein synthesis means. So we all know that DNA is our master blueprint, right? It is the secret to making you. It is the recipe to make everything in your body. So we get all of our information for how to make a protein from the information embedded within our DNA. So the DNA directly codes for the mRNA that we're going to create in transcription, which can tell us the amino acids that are going to be part of our polypeptide. And poly means many, peptide is the bond between amino acids. If you have many amino acids strung together, that's going to make a polypeptide called a protein. Okay, so a segment of DNA is going to hold a code for one protein that makes, that's one gene. So DNA is separated out into different genes. Each gene makes a protein. So we're going to be talking about how um, to read the segment of DNA called a gene, and then how to take that gene, all the information encoded there, and turn it into a protein. So the code's determined by the order of our nitrogenous bases. Now you know if you are an, if you are an elephant, if you are an ant, if you are a human, if you are a gerbil, you have the same four pieces that make you up. It is A, T, G, and C. Those are the nitrogenous bases of DNA. I don't care if you're a tree stump, if you're a mushroom, anything. It's all made of the same four pieces, A, T, G, and C. A always pairs with T, G always pairs with C. You can remember that by like apples grow on trees, gas goes in cars. Okay, that is called Chargoff's rule. So those are the four bases that make up every single thing that is alive on this planet, okay? And the specific order of our nitrogenous bases actually tells us, you know, that's the, that's the information to make you. Hey, you need to make a green eyeball. Hey, you need to make freckles. Hey, you need to do this. Okay, that's what your DNA encodes. So we're gonna use that information to make our proteins, which actually form like our enzymes and our structural proteins to actually make you look the way that you look. Um, so these genes exist in a triplet code, and those are called codons when they're present on mRNA, which is something we're gonna talk about in a minute. That's kind of like the most important factor for like, hey, what are my actual amino acids? What is my protein going to look like? Okay, so for example here, it says that GGC3, that's a triplet, that's gonna code for an amino acid proline. We're gonna look at a codon chart and how to read one of those in a little bit. Whereas GCC, which is very similar, it's only one letter different, is actually going to code for arginine, which is a completely different amino acid. So you can see that the actual code is gonna be very important because that makes your different amino acids and your amino acids, if it's a different you know, strand of them, it's going to make a different protein altogether with different functions because you know that the structure dictates the function, okay? So each one of these triplet sequences, specifically on the mRNA that we'll talk about, actually codes for an amino acid. So our genes, which we talked about being part of our DNA, okay, when we make the mRNA from that gene, like, transcript, okay, it's going to be made of both exons and introns, and it's going to be the opposite of what you think. You'd think, like, exon, exit. Actually, um, the exons are the part that actually codes for the amino acid. That's the stuff we want to keep, whereas the introns are the non-coding sequence that we're actually going to be removing later in the process of mRNA processing. So what's what's this RNA stuff? We've talked about DNA, how it's the, you know, the blueprint of life. RNA is ribonucleic acid. It has a different sugar on it, and it actually contains uracil instead of thymine. Those are two really big differences between DNA and RNA. Also, RNA is single-stranded. Okay, so it's the go-between. So if you think about DNA, where is it? Correct, it's inside of the nucleus, okay? It's inside of the nucleus and it can never leave our nucleus. It is stuck there, okay? But we need to get this information from the DNA to a ribosome. So we need like to play telephone. We need someone to be the go-between. That go-between is called RNA. It's going to carry the message that's encoded within that gene on our DNA. And it's gonna be like, hey DNA, can you tell me the code? Great, thanks man. I'm gonna go deliver this to the ribosome so we can make that protein. That'd be great, thanks so much, right? So the RNA is physically going to transport itself in and out of the nucleus in order to carry the message to a ribosome. So the RNA is going to copy the code on the DNA, 
literally just copying it down. Um, but of course, it's on RNA. So anytime we have a T, it's actually going to be a U for uracil because uracil pairs with adenine. Okay, and in, in the case of RNA, um, so it's going to do that first, and that's called transcription. And then the second part is when the ribosome actually meets up with our mRNA and starts to make the protein called translation. So those are the two steps that we talked about. Okay. All of our RNA is formed inside of the nucleus. We have um, the nucleolus inside of there that makes our rRNA. We also make our tRNA inside of the nucleus and our mRNA, which is going to be very evident here in a second when we talk about transcription specifically. Okay, so we've talked about some of these differences already that RNA differs from DNA because you have uracil instead of thymine when we're talking about RNA. And it also has that ribose sugar instead of the deoxyribose sugar, which just means that it's going to have an extra oxygen. Okay, so then the three types of RNA that we're actually going to see being part of this whole process are going to be the messenger RNA called mRNA, the ribosomal RNA called rRNA, and then our transfer RNA, which is called tRNA. We've already talked about ribosomal RNA like way back when in this chapter, actually, um, when we talked about it being produced in our nucleolus. And so the uh, ribosomal RNA and some proteins are actually what makes up a ribosome. So that's why it's called ribosomal RNA. So these three types of RNA are going to work together to create our proteins from the code embedded in our DNA called a gene. So first we have our messenger RNA. It is a single-stranded molecule, and what it does is it copies the template strand of DNA um, to get the code, and then it's going to transport that to a ribosome. So it's a triplet code that we talked about called codons. So if you have three letters touching a triplet, on the mRNA specifically, which I keep saying mRNA specifically because that's the only place that it's actually called a codon, and that's very important when we read our codon charts. Okay, so a triplet code on, on mRNA is called a codon. That's what's going to help us determine what our amino acids are supposed to be to make our protein. Next, we have ribosomal RNA, which I said this is like what makes up a ribosome. So you have um, the structural component here of our ribosomes as well as some protein, um, and this is where our protein synthesis is going to take place. So obviously it's very important. tRNA is also really important because it's going to help to translate the message from the mRNA. That's why it's called translation. It's going to help translate the message through a process called translation. See how that works? It's great. Okay, so we're going to take that mRNA with the help of tRNA. We're going to turn it into a polypeptide, which again is another word for a protein. So these little transfer RNAs, how are they helpful? Because they're carrying in the amino acid, right? So we just talked about the codon being on mRNA. Again, the codon, the little three, three bases, it's on mRNA. So again, if you're a codon, you're only present on mRNA. I'm saying it because it's really important. Okay, the anti-codon is on transfer RNA. So that's on our tRNA. So that codon on the mRNA is going to base pair with an anticodon present on tRNA, and that's going to, the tRNA is actually um, gonna be bringing in the amino acid. So because the codon pairs with the anticodon, it dictates which specific amino acid is about to be brought in to make our polypeptide, okay? Um, so that's how the anticodon and the codon work together you need them to base pair. And our transfer RNA is literally transferring an amino acid to the ribosome in order for it to base, you know, it's going to pair up through polypeptide bonds um, to create our overall protein. When we bring in a whole bunch of tRNAs, they have a whole bunch of amino acids finally building up to make our functional protein. So as I said, this process includes two different steps, transcription and translation. The first one occurs inside of the nucleus. It is transcription. They also go in alphabetical order for some of those that can't remember anything. Alphabetical order. Transcription, C, comes before translation, before the L. Okay, so DNA information is coded in mRNA. It's the messenger. It has to get the message from the DNA and carry it out to the ribosome. Okay, so transcription occurs in the nucleus, and it occurs first. Why does it occur in the nucleus? You're absolutely right, because that is where the DNA is located, okay? And then we have translation. So translation is going to be when we have all three of our, our RNAs, okay? We have mRNA carrying the message. You have tRNA that's going to carry in the amino acid, and you have rRNA, which is going to help orchestrate the whole thing. It's called a ribosome, right? This is when we're actually going to take that code on mRNA, decode it, and actually make our protein. Again, that's the whole point. This is called protein synthesis, how to make a protein. This is how you do it. Two steps. 
So here's what it looks like again. We looked at a picture at the beginning. Here's another one. Inside we have this little purple structure here called the nucleus. You'd find the DNA inside. Perfect. There it is. Okay. When we have our mRNA being created, that is called transcription. We are transcribing the message from DNA onto a molecule called mRNA, messenger RNA. We do something called RNA processing. Like I said, we want to keep the exons, get rid of the introns, which is counterintuitive, but that's what we're doing. Okay. You'd think introns stay in. No, they don't. Not in this case, in means out in this case. Okay, we keep the exons, get rid of the introns. Then we have our mature mRNA that is fully processed. That mRNA is going to leave the nucleus through what? Through a nuclear pore, which we already talked about in this chapter. Wow, it all connects. It's so amazing how science works, right? That mRNA is gonna go meet up with a ribosome which is composed of rRNA. And then we're gonna bring in some tRNAs to help us, like the codons with the anticodons creating those bonds. So we can bring in our amino acids and have a whole bunch of amino acids eventually form together to create a polypeptide called a protein. And then we're done. That's protein synthesis. So the first step, transcription. Just talked a little bit about that. We have all of the information being held in the DNA. Where? Oh, that's right, it's inside the nucleus because that's where the DNA is. Okay, we're going to copy that information on that DNA gene onto mRNA. It's a little bit more complicated than just that though, okay? Um, because you have DNA that's wound around these histones, histones are proteins that help DNA kind of like bind tightly to itself. Okay, so first thing we have to do is have these transcription factors that are just different proteins that are gonna ha have to help us activate transcription because you don't wanna transcribe all of the DNA at the same time. You're only trying to make certain proteins at a certain time. Your DNA is huge. It's all the directions to make you. And maybe you're just trying to make this one particular enzyme to break down something in your body, right? So you're not going to have to you know, go through and transcribe all of your DNA in order to make that one enzyme. You just need that one gene. So you're gonna activate the transcription of that one gene. So these transcription factors help us do that. So it's going to help to um, you know, release the DNA from the histone a little bit in the area that we wanna transcribe. That way the DNA can be exposed. It's not just like tightly bound to this little protein. Um, we also have binding to special, um, special sequence of the gene to help support transcription. It's called the promoter. That's the starting point. Um, and this occurs on the DNA template. It's like, hey, this is the start of the gene you're trying to make, bind to me, please. Okay, and then we have RNA polymerase, which is going to help us actually synthesize the mRNA once we're attached to the promoter region. So there are three main phases once we have activated the process of transcription through, you know, what we just talked about, the transcription factors. Okay, so we have initiation, elongation, and termination. So initiation, well, you know, that's the start. That's what it means to initiate. Okay, RNA polymerase is going to separate the DNA strands because remember DNA is a double helix. You only want one half of that information, okay, because you can't copy both strands. Our RNA is a single-stranded molecule. You're copying just one strand. So RNA polymerase is going to bind to the promoter and then it's going to separate the DNA strands. Then RNA polymerase is going to go through and it's going to synthesize the mRNA. If the DNA has an A, we're gonna pair it with a U on RNA. If the DNA has a G, we're gonna pair it with a C on the mRNA, okay? And so on until we create our mRNA code, okay? And this is like a temporary little hybrid that exists. It's like DNA and RNA. It's a very temporary structure. And it happens, this whole process happens very fast. So it's extremely, you know, temporary. Um, then we have termination. Well, to terminate means to stop, right? So like very difficult here, sure. Termination means to stop. So transcription, you know, stops when the RNA polymerase reaches the termination signal or the signal to tell it, hey man, you're done. You can go on and do the next step now called translation. Okay, so that's the end of transcription. So we have initiation when we have the binding to the promoter and then the DNA separates. We have elongation, which is actually when we create the mRNA. And then we have termination, which is when you reach the end of that particular gene you're trying to create the protein for, there's a stop signal or a termination signal that's going to be reached and it causes the mRNA, or I'm sorry, it causes the RNA polymerase to kind of like dissociate with the DNA. So here's an image of all that happening. Again, where are we right now? Because the DNA is inside of the nucleus, we are still inside the nucleus. That's where transcription occurs. So your RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region. 
you separate the DNA strand, you start to make your mRNA. Once you are done making your mRNA, the RNA polymerase pops off and you have your mRNA that's completed. And then that's the end of transcription. So now that we have our mRNA, we're gonna process it. So it's actually called, quote, pre-mRNA because it's before our finalized mRNA. Okay, this is like you have a rough draft and you're going to edit it a little bit, okay? Because you don't want to copy anything that has like extra information or mistakes or anything like that. So we're going to be taking out the introns, leaving only the exons. And the proteins that do this are called spliceosomes. And they're responsible for removing the introns and keeping the exons. Once you have all these little exons that are all fragmented because introns were like in between them and everything, they're kind of stitched back together to create one long giant series of exons. And that is going to be your finalized mRNA that will go on and be processed through translation at your ribosome. So translation, this is a step of protein synthesis where the language of nucleic acids, so our base sequences, is going to be translated into amino acids. Translated into, you see that? Translation, translated, great. So we have our nucleic acids like A, in this case, A, U, G, C. Okay, A, U, G, C are our bases here. And then we're going to turn them into amino acids like glycine, proline, asparagine. You don't know all these words yet. That's totally okay. But those are all different types of amino acids. So we have our mRNA that we just created during transcription. Okay. We're going to use our tRNA and our ribosomes in order to translate everything here. Okay. So we have sometimes um, translation occurs at our rough ER because remember that it's, if it's a rough ER, it's because it has ribosomes bound to it. And sometimes our proteins are made in the cytosol at like our free floating ribosomes. It just kind of depends what kind of protein we're making because if it's something that needs to be secreted out of the cell, we need to do it at the rough ER because then the Golgi is going to process that and send it out. Like if it's a secretory vesicle sort of like transport that we previously talked about, that's where those proteins are going to be made. Whereas just like proteins that are like destined to do some enzymatic activity or some functional activity inside of the cell itself will actually be made in the cytosol at one of those free floating ribosomes. So our genetic code, we talked about our um, triplet code called a codon. Now remember, codons exist on mRNA. Okay, there are 64 possible codons. If you have four different bases, A, U, C, and G, and you have three different places that they could be in, so you have four bases, three possible places, of 64 possible combinations. Okay, but three of those are stop codons, which brings us down to 61 combinations, but we only use 20 amino acids in our bodies. So the code has redundancy. We say that the codon code or the amino acid code, because codons help us tell what amino acids we're going to have, it's redundant. So it helps protect against errors. If we have any sort of like uh, substitution mutation that occurs then if it's on the third position, it's highly likely that because of the redundant code, we're still gonna make the correct product. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Here you can see kind of a grainy picture, sorry, of our codon chart. So you can look around the outside and see all the different names of the amino acids. On the inside, you see all of the nitrogenous bases. So remember that translation is when we take nitrogenous bases and we turn them into or translate them into the amino acid code. So for instance, every single one of our human proteins starts off with a signal called AUG. So if you start in the middle, A, you go out a little bit, U, you go out a little bit more, G, you'll see AUG makes MET, methionine. Okay, it makes the amino acid methionine, which is a start signal. That's what your, um, all of your proteins are actually going to start off with methionine. You'll also see that there's a couple different sequences that say stop on here. I believe that there's three of them. So um, UG, uh, UGA and UAA and UAG are our three stop codons. The rest of these are all different amino acids. So for instance, look at the letter C in the middle. So if you have CUU, what does that make? CUU. It makes leucine. What does CUC make? CUC also makes leucine. What does CUA make? 
here's a hint, it's also leucine, and so is CUG. They all make leucine. So the first two are the same, CU, 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 okay? That third position where it doesn't matter what it is because it's all gonna make leucine, that's called the wobble position. And typically, if there's going to be some sort of mutation and it occurs there, it doesn't really matter because if you have CUU, you're gonna make leucine. If you have CUG, guess what? You're still gonna make leucine, so nothing's gonna happen to the protein. So in this case, the redundant code really helps us out to protect against you know, having all these enzymes and things that don't work because if we have this redundancy, there's a highly likely chance that we're going to make the correct product with this redundant code. And if we make the correct product, then we have all our happy functioning enzymes and functional proteins in our bodies, which is exactly what we want. So tRNA, we talked about this, it's going to actually be the thing that carries in those amino acids. So the role of tRNA is to bind the specific amino acid one at a time. So you can see the structure of a tRNA here. The anticodon is going to base pair with a codon on mRNA. And then the tRNA is also carrying in an amino acid. So some people get confused. An anticodon does not make an amino acid. An anticodon is actually attached to tRNA and so is the amino acid. It's the codon, codon chart, that we're actually gonna use to find our amino acids because that calls for a specific tRNA that's gonna carry in a specific amino acid, okay? Um, so our anticodon, like I said, that's a triplet code on tRNA. It base pairs with our codons in order to bring in the correct amino acid. So we build the correct polypeptide. Um, so that's kind of what I just said here. The anticodon tRNA will bind to own, to that one particular codon that it base pairs with to carry in the complementary uh, amino acid that needs to be brought in. This will just repeat. So this will just keep happening over and over again. That The tRNA will just keep coming in and they'll keep binding with all the different codons. The, co the anticodons of the tRNA will bind with the different codons until you have reached the end of the whole um, mRNA sequence. Okay, so we have different sites here, which we'll look at a picture of in just a second, inside of the ribosome. Um, they're called the APE or EPA sites, depending on which direction you're looking at um, of, the, of the ribosome. So you have the amino acyl site for incoming amino acyl tRNAs. Okay, um, you have the, the peptidyl site, which is when you're gonna actually create the peptide bond between the amino acid that's already on the polypeptide chain and the new one that you're bringing in. And then you have the E site, which is for the exit site. So that's when it's already, the tRNA is already dropped off its amino acid. Now it's gonna go on and leave the whole process. And like I said, we'll look at some pictures of this in a minute to make it a little bit more clear. Um, but then we're gonna use the same steps here, initiation, elongation, and termination. Okay, so translation occurs in these same three phases, but it's also gonna require ATP, protein factors, and other enzymes to help us process the whole thing here. So during initiation, you have the small ribosomal subunit because remember we talked about how ribosomes, I draw them like Krabby Patties. They have a small section and a big section. So the small ribosomal, ribosomal subunit is going to bind to the special uh, codon that I said is called methionine. That's our start codon for all of our human proteins. It's gonna bind there um, in order for the mRNA to be decoded. Okay, you also have the large site, that, or the large subunit that's going to form to create like your Krabby Patty where the ribosome is the bun and the middle part, the meat, the Krabby Patty part is going to be like your mRNA. Okay, that's kind of how I think about it. It's like two buns and a patty. So you have your ribosomal subunits sandwiching your mRNA together. Okay, so ribosome is going to scan along the mRNA until it finds the methionine codon, which is going to be our start codon. So when the anticodon of the initiator tRNA binds to the start codon, it's going to carry in that methionine. That's the start of our protein. The large ribosomal subunit is going to attach once that um, a first tRNA is actually bound to its codon. Okay, um, at the end of the initiation, you have the initiator tRNA in the P site for the um, peptidyl site, um, and the A site and the E site are empty. And again, we will look at a picture in just a minute, that way all this makes more sense. Elongation is step number two of our three steps. 
And this actually involves three steps itself. So you have codon recognition, which is when you have those tRNAs that are going to bind to the complementary codon, because remember, tRNA has an anti-codon that will bind to the codon. And this is going to happen in the A site of the ribosome. Um, that's the amino acyl site. Okay, then the peptide, so the whole thing will slide over into the next site after it's in the first site. Okay, so the first part is just binding the anticodon to the codon. The second site is when we actually have that peptide bond formation. So like I said, you have a growing peptide chain, okay? And each time you bring in a new amino acid, it has to be added to that chain through a peptide bond. So ribosomal enzymes are going to transfer and attach the growing polypeptide chain from the tRNA in the P site over to the amino acid of the tRNA in the A site. So you're binding the new amino acid to the existing polypeptide chain. And then in our last site, you have translocation. So the ribosome is going to shift down three bases because we're reading codons, which are three bases of mRNA, which is going to displace one of the tRNAs. Okay, so a tRNA in the A site is going to move to the P site. tRNA in the P site is going to move to the E site. And the tRNA in the E site is going to be ejected because E is for exit. And again, I promise you there's a picture in a second, and we're going to go back through this. So elongation continued here. Once the A site is empty, a new TNR, tRNA, <laughs> a new tRNA can enter. So it goes like A-P-E, like the word ape, okay? So I think about it like the first one, anticodon, A for anticodon. It's for amino acyl, but the anticodon binds to the codon. In the second one, so A, next letter in ape is P. This is when you have your polypeptide bond, okay, you're going to add your amino acid, your amino acid to the growing um, polypeptide. And then the next site is the E site, which is the exit site, because it's already come in, it's attached, it's dropped off its amino acid, and now the tRNA can leave. And that's essentially what's happening here, okay. Um, this is showing you the coming together, the start of the mRNA, you have the ribosomal subunits coming together, you have the growing polypeptide chain, and then at the end of the mRNA, you have a dissociation of the ribosome once you reach the end. So the termination, okay, so how do you know when to stop? Um, when one of the three stop codons that we looked at when we looked at the codon chart, um, UGA, UAA, and UAG, Okay, on the mRNA, that codes for a stop codon. So when it enters that first site, APE, the first site, A, okay, translation ends. The protein release um, factors are going to bind to the stop codon, causing water to be added to the chain instead of another um, tRNA to bring in another poly or another amino acid because you're already done creating your protein. You don't need any more amino acids. Okay, and this causes the release of the polypeptide chain as well as the separation of the ribosomal, ribosomal subunits, which we just talked about, okay? Then we're actually going to degrade the mRNA. It's kind of like all the little pieces get recycled and used again when we have to do another um, protein synthesis process. So the final polypeptide will be further processed by other cellular structures into its 3D protein. So remember that just the strand of amino acids is the primary structure, and that's not a functional structure of a protein yet. We still have to go and make our alpha helices and beta sheets, then you have to go in and fold further. And then eventually when you have multiple polypeptide chains coming together that have all been folded to create your um, quaternary globular structure, that's when you have a fully functioning enzyme. So this is the overall process that we were talking about. Okay, you see how I'm talking about the EPA or the APE sites? It just depends which way you're reading it. Okay, so this is the overall process. So Translation is the process when we have the genetic information carried by that mRNA that we created in transcription, the previous step. We're going to decode it at the ribosome to make a specific polypeptide or protein. So you have the initi initiation step here. So you have the small and large ribosomal, ribosomal, I don't know why this is so difficult for me to say today, ribosomal subunits coming together once it identifies that first tRNA carrying in um, the methionine. Okay, so that means that the, the large ribosome, wow, ribosomal subunit can actually attach. So that's what I was talking about with like a little Krabby Patty. It's like two buns with a little sandwich of like our mRNA in the middle. Okay, so you can see that that's occurring in the P site there. And so we have our first methionine as the start uh, codon there. The A, um, AUG is our start codon because it codes for methionine. Then as you go through um, our elongation process, 
you're just going to keep having every three bases, the, uh, the ribosome is actually going to shift. It's going to move up and down the, um, the mRNA. That way you have a codon that's going to change position. So it's going to always enter into the A site. It will go to the P site. It will go to the um, E site. And then whatever tRNA is left over will be removed. That's the exit site. So you'll just keep doing that until you're growing your uh, polypeptide chain here, which is that little, like, it looks like little, like, yellowy, orangey pill looking things. The first one says MET for methionine. And then you have a bunch of blank ones. Okay. So then you're adding in a whole bunch of your amino acids. That's the growing polypeptide chain. And then once you reach the termination site, remember that you're introducing water. That way you don't have another um, amino acid binding onto your chain because you're already done making your protein. And if you have extra amino acids, you're not making the right protein anymore. Okay, so this is the overall process. That's what I was talking about with the different sites. Each site within the large ribosomal subunit has a codon in it. And all of the tRNAs enter into the, the active site, the A site. Okay, that's your amino acyl site. That's when the anti-codon binds to the codon. In the P site, once the ribosome slides down three bases, then you have the... Um, the anticodon bound to the codon in the P site, which is when you will have the transfer, your your um, amino acid is going to be transferred onto that polypeptide chain because you're going to create a peptide bond. And then, then once the ribosome moves down three more, so one more codon, you are going to have a release of that, quote, empty tRNA because it doesn't have an amino acid anymore. It came in, it binded, it uh, dropped off its amino acid, and now it's going to go out and be recycled um, for another protein. Okay, so that's how the whole thing works. It just happens, it slides three bases at a time, one codon at a time, and as it's sliding along, as the ribosome sliding along the mRNA, it's just causing the different uh, codons and anticodons, so the mRNA and the tRNA to be kind of like sliding down the ribosome with each time it moves. And then you're just ejecting all the pieces once you actually have the amino acid bound to our growing polypeptide chain. Okay, so like I said, sometimes this happens at the rough ER and sometimes this happens at cytoplasmic uh, ribosomes. It just depends the kind of protein that you're making. So the role of the rough ER in protein synthesis here, um, when you have a short amino acid se uh, segment, it's called the ER signal sequence, so the endoplasmic reticulum uh, signal sequence. It's present on a growing polypeptide chain, and this signals associated ribosome to dock to the rough ER surface. So this typically means that this is going to be something that needs to be processed a little bit more than just a cytoplasmic um, protein. Okay, so once you have a docked ribosome onto our rough ER, you're um, forming your polypeptide, it's going to actually go into the ER and kind of be on like the internal surface of that. So sometimes we have sugar groups that can be added to the protein. So its shape is gonna be altered a little bit or the protein that's gonna be enclosed in a vesicle for transport through the Golgi, like I said. So this is what that would look like. So when you have a cytoplasmic ribosome that's creating a protein, that protein is just existing in the cytoplasm. And sometimes it'll go meet up with other polypeptide chains in order to form more like globular structural protein. Sometimes, like I said, in this case, when you have the rough ER, you have your proteins that are going to be um, destined for transport. So in this case, you see that you have a ribosome that has bound to the ER on the rough ER, okay? That polypeptide is actually going into the uh, the interior or the cistern of our rough ER. So as you have the growing polypeptide chain, okay, it can be modified there. So like in this case, you've added a sugar group onto our polypeptide chain. So it's a um, like a glycoprotein in this case, because glyco is the prefix for sugar and then a protein because we're making a polypeptide here. So these little guys are gonna all be transferred through our transport vesicles. You see that it's pinching off there um, to go and be delivered wherever they're supposed to go. If this is supposed to be on the external surface of the cell, this little vesicle will then go meet up with the plasma membrane and secrete the protein to the exterior surface of our cell. It just depends specifically what each one of these proteins is built for. But typically, if they're going to be moved somewhere around the cell, they'll be, they'll be formed on the rough ER. So then the Golgi can actually go through and process them 
change whatever else needs to be changed and deliver them where they're supposed to go through vesicular transport, which we also previously talked about. So our summary here, um, again, DNA has all of our, uh, our blueprint, right? That is all the directions for everything. We need to get that information from the DNA to a uh, ribosome in order to make our polypeptides. So we have our DNA code being transferred onto mRNA through transcription. mRNA is uh, consisting of codons. So those are three bases at a time. It's the triplets, so the three bases at a time, and that's how you read them. Um, then you have your codons that are gonna be base paired with our tRNA anticodons in order to bring in the correct amino acid during translation, which occurs out in either the cytoplasm or at the rough ER. It just depends on what kind of protein we're making here. Um, and once we have enough of these tRNAs coming in, they're going to be producing our overall polypeptide as they drop off an amino acid with each one that binds. So here's an overall sequence again, the information transfer from our DNA to our RNA to the polypeptide. This is called the central dogma of biology that says that we can take the code present in our genes, our DNA, Okay, that's what you inherit. Your genes are just different sections of that DNA that code for different proteins. So that DNA has to transfer the information to the mRNA. mRNA is then going to transfer the information to our um, ribosomes with the help of tRNA to help to translate the message in order to make a fully functioning polypeptide or protein at the end of all of this. So again, that's the central dogma of biology. DNA to RNA to protein. That is called the central dogma of biology. We also have DNA playing other roles. We're not really gonna get into this, but just in case you see them in any of the articles or anything that we read in class, um, DNA codes for other types of RNA. And these are like still areas that we're researching a whole lot because it's not like we know a whole lot about them yet because they're still relatively new. So you have micro RNAs or miRNAs. These are small RNAs that can bind to and silence different parts of the mRNAs um, made by certain exons. So this could help to inactivate certain genes essentially, but it's not actually binding to the DNA, it's gonna bind to the mRNA. So once the transcript is made, it's kind of like regulating what parts are actually created. You also have riboswitches. So these are folded RNAs that act as switches that can turn protein synthesis on or off in response to certain environmental conditions. Um, so this would be beneficial, like, just as an example, when you eat a whole lot of, like, um, like dairy products, you need to have a whole lot of lactase to help you break down that lactose. You don't need a whole lot of it when you're not eating things that contain lactose. So this would be like a signal to turn on the transcription of those particular genes to help you make your lactase enzymes because you just ate lactose. So you don't wanna waste a bunch of energy when you don't need to create certain proteins. So this is kind of like a switch to help your body determine like, hey, you need to make more of this right now. Okay, now you can stop making that. Don't use your ATP up on that. Like we don't need that anymore. Okay, then we also have small interfering RNAs called siRNAs. These are very similar to our microRNAs, but they can also be made to silence mRNA from pathogenic sources like viruses. Um, and they're doing some research with small interfering RNAs on lysogenic um, viruses. Lysogenic viruses are viruses that embed themselves inside of your DNA. Um, things like AIDS, HIV, right, herpes, things that you have, like once you have it, you have it for life because it actually embeds itself within your DNA, your blueprint, and becomes part of you. And there's nothing that you can really do. You can take medicine to help treat it, but you can never cure it. So using small interfering RNAs, if you can have that bind to and silence specific um, mRNA sequences, like ones that are um, encoding for specific proteins, um, that viruses are telling your body to make because they are lysogenic and they've become part of your DNA. If you can silence those, then that means that you're not ever expressing, you don't have the symptoms of that virus anymore. So your body's not going to be, you know, experiencing any of those symptoms, which would be really, really cool if we could fix it that way instead of just with a whole bunch of drugs. Um, so these are just some of the other roles that DNA can play. As you can see, DNA, you know, pretty freaking important, right? So again, this whole thing was about protein synthesis. It's about the central dogma of biology. 
So you're taking the information from DNA and coding it onto mRNA. mRNA is going to join up with tRNA and a ribosome in order to, to translate that whole message that was encoded and then create a functional protein. We made it, we finished it, chapter three, it's done, it's history, your test is coming up. Please go back and listen to these again. Yes, they're long, yes, they're kind of awful to sit through, I understand it, I had to do it myself, I'm doing it right now, in fact. Please go back through, please look up some pictures, look up some videos on YouTube other than this one to show you some like cool graphics, because like I don't have cool graphics technology over here, I just have a little bit of knowledge to drop on you, okay? Please go back through this, look at some pictures, please read your textbook. This test has a lot of different information on it, like very varying information. Okay, we made it, finished chapter three. Have a great day.